I'm Kerry Morwedge. Um, I'm a professor of marketing at Boston University. Uh, yesterday, we were talking a lot about revealed, stated, and normative preferences. We have a paper coming out in Nature Human Behavior. It's embargoed, so please don't share it. Um, yeah. but, um, but if you'd like to download the paper, we talk about um, the distinction between them, how algorithms are training on revealed preferences, um, and we would talk about three kinds of test cases with empirically demonstrated divergences between revealed and stated preferences um, that I think are useful for people who are doing any kind of platform design um, or any kind of algorithm design. And then we also talk about actionable ways forward for both researchers and designers to try to quantify these biases and also ways for platforms to retrain their algorithms with existing kinds of techniques um, to improve that. So um, I'm not gonna talk about that today, um, but I hadn't planned on talking about that here, but I, we were talking about it yesterday, so if, if you're interested, please have a look. At, it's a short read. Okay, um, today I'm gonna talk more about <clears throat> using algorithms to help people detect their own biases. Um, and this uh, work is with Begum um, Selek Tutan and Romain Catarillo, who are two fantastic collaborators at Erasmus. Begum's a PhD student, so if you're hiring in the future, um, take a look. Okay, so um, there's been a lot of work in the last five years thinking about algorithmic bias. Uh, you could think about um, examples of how Amazon found a gender bias in its hiring algorithm that preferenced men over women. Um, and a lot of this work references, uh, reveals sort of that, we talk about algorithmic bias, but it's algorithmic bias is really sort of codified human bias. Uh, which algorithms are just picking up on the biases in the human decisions on which they're trained off, in often cases. And so we see this in a variety of different kinds of important contexts like hiring. We see it in uh, judicial decisions. Like there's a lot of been work, there's been a lot of work on Compass and how it shows a racial bias and how it determines risk profiles for who gets to um, receive bail and who's um, not allowed to go out on bail. Um, and more recent work has been trying to think about, okay, well, how do we take algorithmic bias and what do we learn from that? And I think um, Jen and some other folks have had really interesting work talking about how algorithms we can think about this algorithmic bias as a way to reveal structural biases in our society, right? So we see a, Amazon learned that it had a structural bias in its hiring paradigms, right? And Amazon's solution was to delete its algorithm, um, not to retrain its HR managers, at least that's a like, public thing. But we can, learn, we can learn from these kinds of situations that we have a problem from algorithms, right? So if we see that when we look at black and white patients, the, um, the same black patient is scored as, as healthy as a white patient when they're considerably more sick, right? We see that that's a, there's a racial bias in the way the doctors are scoring the health of patients and using something like healthcare spending where white patients are, um, receive more healthcare spending than black patients, there's racial bias in healthcare and we have to do something about it, right? So we can learn about structural biases in our organizations and our societies from algorithms. And this work that we're, I'm gonna talk about today is really beyond the organization, can we use algorithms to learn something about our own biases at an individual level. So is it not just about our society, but about ourselves? Um, and this, this work is really motivated by, there's been a flurry of research looking at when are people willing to use algorithms, um, and there's incredible differences in domains on people's preferences to rely on algorithms or humans for advice. So I would, I would suggest, John has an amazing example in a paper that he presented yesterday at the poster session where if you asked someone, would you prefer to ask for an algorithm or a human for directions to the airport, right? Like Nathaniel like knows LA very well, but even if Nathaniel told me how to get to LAX, I would still look at Google Maps, right? And it's not because they don't trust you, it's just I think Google Maps has better information. Like I, I prefer to rely on the algorithm than an expert or even like a hotel concierge, right? So in, in some kinds of cases, people have preferences for algorithms over humans. And so to think about like algorithm aversion as being general seems a little far-fetched, right? In other cases, we've been talking about this a lot today too, um, most of us would, most of us I would say, would pr prefer <laughs> not to be involved in a romantic relationship with an algorithm, you might prefer a human, at least for, you know, maybe wow. depending on their extroversion, openness, and conscientiousness, right? So, um, yeah. Um, so I, I had a paper in 2000, um, in last year in ticks where we, like I tried to look at the space and what really came out was that this, these kinds of domain preferences are not about um, like a prejudice against algorithms in specific kinds of cases, but I think they can be really predicted by 
what do I, like what domains do I identify with? And how ambiguous are the criteria we're using to evaluate algorithms? Like in a, you know, a GPS wayfinding situation, it's pretty clear like if you get to the airport faster, it's a better algorithm, right? If my directions like don't get you lost, it's a better algorithm. In the case of movie preferences, I know that's more subjective, right? So like what's success there? And so if you, even if you look at, for example, domains like driving, there's some people like me who really love driving. There's some people who view driving as like an incredible chore. And so I might be excited to have an automated, I might be not wanting to have an automated vehicle, whereas like someone who views it as a chore does. And so you see that kind of dimension. And what I think is really interesting about this kind of map is that these are precisely the dimensions where we show self-serving biases when we compare ourselves to other people. And so the inference I would take out of this is that in many kinds of cases, we're viewing algorithms like other people, and the biases we have against algorithms are often in this, come in the same places as we would have when we make social comparisons to other people. And just to show you some of like the predictive power of this theory, um, you know, people show reticence to adopt automated vehicles for themselves, right? So if you ask people, um, like, how much do you trust the driving capabilities of an automated vehicle relative to yourself, right? So people say, I'm a better driver than an automated vehicle. But if we ask people, think about other drivers, how, like, what's their capability? How much do you trust them? How safe a driver are they? And relative to automated vehicles, people are like, yeah, like, you're just as good as an automated vehicle, right? Like, I'm, I'm a great driver, you, got, you're, you know, you are about the same as an AV, right? Um, and so what we, if we unpack this kind of rating, we see it's really about people are overestimating their own driving ability relative to other people. They don't have different views of AVs depending on if the comparison is between the self and AV or others in AV. And like the downstream consequences are really interesting. If we ask people, you know, there's six levels of automation that you could have for vehicles. If we ask people, what level of automation would you buy if you could? People give a lower level than if you ask, what level of automation would you prefer other people buy, right? And if we look at fully autonomous vehicles, we see that people think people are less willing to buy a fully autonomous vehicle for themselves, but they want other people to buy them. So like some of this is really useful too in thinking about downstream ways of shaping public policy too, like telling people that we're gonna replace your car is gonna be much more threatening than telling people we're gonna take all those other drivers off the road, right? <laughs> and so you could think about like what are some of the ways around thinking about this. So we wanted to see whether or not we could use this intuition that in many ways, people see algorithms like other people to help see whether or not algorithms can reveal our bias blind spot. So when we think about our own biases and we look at other people's biases, people have a better ability to see biases in other people than they do in themselves. And part of this is because when we think about was our decision-making process biased, we think about, you know, do I see consciously that I thought about gender or I thought about race when I was making this hiring decision? When we look at other people's decisions, we look at did they hire a man or a woman, did they hire someone who is black or white or who, is, who looked like them or was from their culture, right? So those, like we see, we look at our, we introspect into our decision making processes to think about our own biases and we look at other people's decisions to look at their biases and so that leads to this bias blind spot. And so we try to see if we think about algorithms like other people, maybe people will be better able to see their own biases and algorithms, even algorithms trained on their own data, and even algorithms that make the same decisions as they do, um, than in their own decisions as well. And so we have uh, six experiments on like a two-sided platform, and everything here is like pre-registered, it's all open data. Um, it's uh, under review, but I'll show you the data. Okay, so the basic paradigm is the same for all the six studies. We have two sets of ratings, um, people are rating either hosts in an Airbnb scenario, or they're rating drivers on a rideshare platform like Uber. We give people diagnostic attributes that they should be using, like star ratings or cleanliness, um, or number of, dri uh, number of trips. And we also give them a biasing irrelevant attribute, like the driver's gender or race or attractiveness, and we don't mention this, but we manipulate it using validated kinds of stimuli. Um, so for example, in this case, we're looking at gender bias in uh, ratings of driving ability, so people uh, have a gender bias, they rate men as being better drivers than women. Um, and here we would um, basically show people a picture of a, a picture of a white or white man or white woman. Um, we would manipulate what kind, um, we would manipulate what their um, star rating is, their experience in the platform, the number of trips, and the car, those are all random kinds of 
attributes. And so we're just having, looking at their comparison when we're having these attributes randomly and like see whether or not people are giving men higher ratings than women. And then afterwards we show people their, we show people these kinds of ratings in, in the second set of ratings. So there's two sets. And we either tell people that these are your ratings or we tell them that they're the, rating of, the ratings of an algorithm trained on your data or we tell people these are other people's ratings or they're, the, um, they're an algorithm trained on other participants' dating, data. And so in some cases we have actual algorithms, in some cases we're using, just using deception. So for example, like what the summary data would look like in the, um, in the host case, I'm, I'm highlighting these um, just for your benefit. So in the host case, people would see um, the summary data of ratings from set B with the starting of each host um, and their name. And these are um, taken from a paper by um, Bertrand and Molinathan. Um, and, or they would see um, faces in a, in a summary rating and see what the, what the rating they gave along with the um, driver number of trips and their star ratings and their, and their information. And then after we'd ask people, to what extent would you see racial bias to have influenced your ratings or the algorithm's ratings? To what extent do you see gender bias to have influenced the, your ratings, the algorithm's ratings? So in the first experiment, we're looking at um, Airbnb listings um, and we're looking at uh, perceived racial bias. And so we have people rate the extent to which they see racial bias in their own ratings, the, ra the extent to which they see racial bias in the ratings of an algorithm that was trained on their data. And in this case, we're just showing them the ratings, just attributing it to an algorithm. And then in two other conditions, we actually create an actual algorithm, which is just like a multiple regression, and we predict their ratings based on the ratings in the first set to, to test for validity. And just to address um, uh, dis concerns about deception, I mean, in one case, they, we only have people rate drivers from set A, we don't have them ever see set B, and in another case, we have ratings from set A and set B. So in this case, we're showing people a real algorithm's predictions or their own ratings uh, got under the guise of an algorithm. So this is what we find. So people, it doesn't really matter if the algorithm is real or is their own ratings. We see in all these kinds of cases that people see less bias in the ratings when they're attributing them to themselves than when they're attributed to uh, an algorithm or when it's an actual algorithm trained on their ratings. Right, so people see uh, more bias in the algorithm than they see in themselves. And then the next question is, is this just something about algorithms or is it really revealing a bias blind spot? Um, to test this question, we then looked at how people saw the bias in, if we attributed it to another person or to an algorithm trained on another person's data. Um, and in this case, we looked at um, perceived gender bias in the ratings of dry chair drivers. Um, and here we see basically that people see less bias in their own ratings then we attribute their own ratings to an, an algorithm trained on their data, and we also see the same effect for others. So it doesn't matter if the others is a person or an algorithm trained on other people's data, people see the same bias there. They just see less bias in their own ratings when they believe they were the ones making those ratings. So um, we also replicate this in the case of racial bias in the Airbnb listings. So here again, we see no differences in the perceived bias of an algorithm trained on your data, in other people's ratings or an algorithm trained on other people's ratings, we only see that people are seeing less bias in their own ratings. And just to show you it's about the bias blind spot, we also do another study where we measure people's bias blind spot with this 14 item scale that um, Irina Scopoliti and I and colleagues developed. And we see evidence of the bias blind spot. So this is the tendency to view others as more biased than yourself. So you can see the distribution is pretty uh, extreme. There's, no, there's very few people who think that they're less but they're more biased than other people. Um, and then we look at that, how that interacts with perceived gender bias. And we see that people who are low in bias blind spot are less likely to show this difference between self and algorithm, whereas people who are higher in bias blind spot are more likely to see bias in the ratings of an algorithm trained on their data than in their own data. And then one question is, is this unique to bias? So we used some work from the 1990s from social psychology where people there are different kinds of attributes where people are more motiv motivated to feel unprejudiced. So if something is diagnostic, you should not be as worried about appearing unprejudiced as if it's, more di um, if it's less diagnostic. And so we see um, people, um, for star ratings, people perceive themselves to have been as influenced by star ratings as the algorithm trained on their data. So in other words, when, it, when an attribute is not associated with bias, people don't discriminate between themselves and the algorithm. Uh, but when people see, um, in the case of um, racial, in, when, when we think about race, people do perceive themselves to be less influenced by race um, when it's their ratings than when, when it's attributed to an algorithm. 
And then the last question is, if we are better able to see these kinds of biases in our, in our judgments through the lens of an algorithm or reflected in an algorithm as a mirror, um, are we better able to correct those biases as well? Because one of the first kinds of things for debiasing is being able to recognize bias or see it or understand it. And so we then have a, a last study where we have people rate uh, drive, rideshare drivers. Um, these are varied in terms of their attractiveness. We tell them about the beauty premium where people tend to give more favorable ratings to, towards people who are attractive um, and ask them to what extent were you influenced by this um, versus an algorithm trained on your data. And then we give them an option to revise their rating. So we start a slider on like their performer rating. We tell them if you feel like the bias was influential, feel free to correct it. And we see that people perceive there to be more influence of this beauty premium in the, the ratings of an algorithm trained on their data than in their, their own data when it's attributed to them. And we see people are also more willing to correct those judgments um, when it's attributed to an algorithm than to themselves. Um, and this is mediated by the perceived influence. So the, the, the undoing this bias blind spot is directly affecting their willingness to um, uh, make corrections. Okay, so in short, we see algorithms reveal the bias blind spot. We see people see their, more of their biases in algorithms. Um, whether the algorithm is trained on their decision, even if it's making the same decision as they did. Um, we see that people see as much bias in the decisions of these algorithms trained on their data as they do in other people. Um, and they're more likely to correct their bias um, in the decisions of algorithms than in their own decisions. Um, and I think, you know, we know for a long time that algorithmic bias reflects human bias, and we tend to think about it as in, often in negative kinds of ways because we know that algorithmic bias can codify and amplify human bias. But I think this is an interesting first step in thinking about how algorithms can help people identify and reduce their own biases as well. Um, and if you have suggestions about, you know, what's the recommendations for it, um, I was listening yesterday. So if things about way to extend this into practice, I think that'd be really helpful. Thank you so much.